Thank you very much. <coughs> and we we'll move on with the next paper. Uh, Manuel Fernandez Goods. Uh, yes, good afternoon and thanks. Thank you uh, for inviting me to present a paper in this session. I have to apologize that I came in a bit late and I have to leave immediately after my paper, but this is because uh, we are having the EAA executive board meeting and I will have to return, so sorry for disappearing after this. Uh, so I will try to give a very brief overview on uh, urbanization processes in the late Iron Age. And obviously in 15 minutes I can just select a few things. I will particularly focus on the question if uh, where this process is rather bottom-up or top-down. Uh, there's a lot of uh, recent literature on the topic of centralization and urbanization in the Iron Age. I'm just listing here three edited volumes, but there are many others. And if you are interested in reading more about the arguments I'm presenting here, uh, I also published an article uh, at the beginning of this year in the Journal of Archaeological Research, which is open access, so you can uh, have a look at that. So I'm um, particularly focusing on uh, Central Western Europe. Uh, and in this area, during the Iron Age, the first millennium BC, we have two different periods of emergence of large uh, agglomerations. An important point is that there is no, uh, no continuity between these two different stages. So there's a first period in the, uh, mostly in the sixth and fifth centuries BC, where we see the emergence of some large settlements, uh, the so-called first city or princely seats with some sites such as the Hornibook or Bush that could reach at certain moments uh, up to 100 or even in the case of Bush, 200, 300 hectares. Uh, and then there's a period of discontinuity in the fourth and part of the third century BC where we see the disappearance or at least a marked decline uh, of these centers. And then in the third century BC, we see the start of a new process of concentration of population and activities at certain sites. Uh, and this gives rise to, the, to a number of open agglomerations uh, and also the fortified settlements that we know as Opida. And as I say, it's important to emphasize that this is a non-linear uh, development, so uh, this is important in order to react the linear models uh, of evolution, which do not work here for the, for the European Iron Age. Uh, I have published in the last years, uh, and many other colleagues as well, quite a lot on the earlier stage of the 6th, 5th century BC, first in city. Today I will focus on the late Iron Age urbanization processes that took place um, <coughs> between the 3rd and the 1st centuries BC. So after the period of decentralization of the 4th uh, and early 3rd centuries BC, we see a new mom uh, movement towards concentration uh, of population, uh, increase in economic production, trade activities related to demographic growth. And here we have open agglomerations and the fortified sites. Uh, and for a long time, scholars have focused mostly on the fortified sites, the Opida, but actually we know that the situation now, that the situation was much more uh, complex and actually these processes of uh, concentration of population and economic activities began much earlier than the foundation of the fortified sites. So uh, some scholars uh, have uh, created new categories to acknowledge this diversity of a large site in the period. For example, Vladimir Salaj distinguishes between four different categories. The first two of them are open settlements. The second ones are fortified. So he speaks about centers of production and distribution, centers of the Nemsitzer Rosseldorf type. These two were open. And then among the opida, he distinguishes between mountain opida and lowland opida. And he also uh, attaches a series of criteria and characteristics for all the centers. And uh, what has been particularly important in the last few decades is the acknowledgments of the importance of the open agglomerations. Uh, they started earlier than the fortified opida, already in the third or in the early second century BC, depending on the site. And we can name some important examples uh, that we have between uh, Western uh, France and Central Eastern Europe, for example, Olna, Levru, Version Polanten, Lovosice, Nemsic, Sayupetri. And some of these open agglomerations uh, were large production and distribution centers. So they fulfilled a very important economic role. And in some of them, we also have evidences for uh, uh, sanctuaries, religious, political activities. Among the features that we can find in many of these open agglomerations, we have coin minting, imports from distant regions, including, some, including sometimes from the Mediterranean. 
a metallurgical production on a large scale, manufacture of glass objects, etc. So a whole set of economic activities that in some cases have been described as a uh, proto-industrial. So how should we uh, interpret this and how does the role of open agglomerations uh, make us rethink the urbanization process in the late Iron Age? So the Oppida, the start mostly around the end of the very end of the second and beginning of the first century BC, and this has often been linked uh, particularly in regions such as in, in central, central Gaul or southern Germany, with the growing expansion of Rome, the conquest of southern France, the Narbonensis, and this would have triggered the appearance of the Oppida. Uh, I'm not discarding, I'm not neglecting that uh, this increasing pressure from Rome played a role in the development of the Oppida, but what we see, and the urban agglomerations make it very clear, is that the process of centralization or urbanization was earlier. This goes back to the third century BC. And it's part of what I have already mentioned, broader trends that we can observe, uh, demographic growth, increasing agricultural and artisanal production, <clears throat> uh, new tools, new application, flourishing trade. So the roots of the entire process, uh, well, there's always a combination of internal and external roots, but I think we need to give more importance to the internal roots, uh, at least for the beginning, at least for the open agglomerations. And then, obviously, in later stages, uh, we see an increasing uh, contact and pressure from Rome that accelerated the process. Uh, if we compare open agglomeration uh, and uh, fortified oppida, we see that uh, on occasions the number of fines recovered at the open settlement is uh, even exceeds the fines that we have from some prominent oppida. Uh, this is a table published, for example, by uh, Vladimir Salaj. And uh, the range of uh, activities uh, that were happening at this site uh, are often very similar. For example, if we compare Beijing Polantin and uh, the nearby oppidum of Manchin. <coughs> So, uh, several scholars, and I support this idea, uh, have emphasized that uh, we need to discard the idea, the traditional idea that uh, the important uh, economic activities were concentrated in fortified sites. They were not. In many cases, open settlements had an equally or even more important economical role. And we should also question the, uh, the role of walls or fortifications as proxies for urbanism. In fact, uh, many open agglomerations are closer to a contextual definition of city than some of the fortified sites. We have some, I would say some opida, yes, some opida we can say that they were towns or cities, but others, we also know others that have very little uh, evidence for internal occupation. Uh, so in terms of uh, social processes, power dynamics, it seems that most open agglomerations developed over a period of time as a result of organic growth. And in this sense, mm -hmm. uh, bottom-up processes seem to have played an important role. And we like to contrast this with the Oppida, the fortified settlements. We know more than 150 of them uh, within, uh, within the Atlantic coast and uh, Hungary and Slovakia. Uh, they date from the mostly in the end of the second or beginning of the first century BC. And usually when scholars uh, use the term Oppidum, we are referring to a fortified site from this period with an area of at least 10 hectares, in some cases several hundred hectares, as you can see here. And it obviously it's a Latin term that was used uh, by also particularly Julius Caesar to describe the settlement, and this was adopted by archaeologists in the 19th century. So we have this emergence of the Oppida, but with an already exist, a pre-existing network of open agglomerations. So what happened to the open agglomerations when we see the, the foundation of the Oppida? <coughs> well, actually there are many answers. There is no one single uh, scenario. We can uh, distinguish four main uh, scenarios uh, sometimes we have the abandonment of an open agglomeration in favor of a new settlement, so a move from the plain to the hill, for example, at Le Brou in France. Uh, sometimes uh, we see the continuation of an open agglomeration uh, despite the foundation of an opidum nearby. Uh, in other cases, uh, a pre-existing open agglomeration becomes fortified at a certain moment of its history. This is the case, for example, in Manching in Bavaria. Uh, and finally, uh, in some cases, we also have the foundation of an open agglomeration in the immediate vicinity of an already existing oppidum. And uh, this last case, for example, uh, happens in Bibracte in central France, where we have the large oppidum mentioned in Britain sources, uh, which has an area that in different moments covered 200 and later 130 hectares. Uh, more recent research carried out by colleagues such as Tom Moore has identified an important uh, open agglomeration in the immediate vicinity of the fortified site on the mountain. Uh, uh, 
more than 100 hectares large, and then we have a very dense network also of contemporary rural sites. So uh, when people speak about Vibracte, should we only think about the fortified site in the mountain and close by the walls, or was Vibracte actually a much larger settlement complex and we need to understand this as being part of the same system, the fortified area, the open agglomeration, and the surroundings. Uh, in the case of the Opida, the majority of them seem to have been founded as the result of a deliberate political decision uh, that in, in many cases might have involved processes of synergism. Uh, and in this sense, uh, it has been suggested that this were a, a process directed mostly top-down by elites, and when we say elites, we're not meaning uh, we're not meaning necessarily one single person, but we can think about a system uh, of uh, dif different representatives of uh, different lineages, mem uh, different aristocratic members, and then take decisions and at certain point found this opera. But there were mostly foundations ex novo. Most of the opera were created uh, at a certain period of time as a deliberate project, rather than the process of a larger. Uh, uh, evolution as in the case of open settlements. Uh, this doesn't mean that there are no links with the past. In, in some cases, the Opida occupy sites that had an earlier significance, so there were probably places that were important in the social memory. Some of them we know they had uh, some kind of ritual, religious significance, but they were founded ex novo. And we can also see this process as um, a, if, uh, and I have developed this in a number of papers, uh, adopting a Foucauldian perspective, as a new technology of power that was enabling a more hierarchical and centralizing ideology. Uh, another example of the complexity of Iron Age settlement landscapes uh, that needs us to lead to rethink some of our previous models. Uh, Mathieu Pou uh, has been uh, carrying out extensive research in the area of Coron in the Auvergne in, in, in France. And here we have three opera that are located in close proximity, Coro, Jacobi, Gondol. Uh, previously, it was believed that it was a chronological decalage. So uh, one was created, then abandoned, and then they moved to the next one, then to the next one. Uh, new research suggests that they were at least partly contemporaneous. So he has suggested in a paper from 2014 that we need to think this as a, 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 as a complex uh, settlement system encompassing a, a large territory rather than just thinking uh, in single site, we need to understand this as a whole. And uh, to come uh, to an end, what happened to the system? Well, it mostly ends with the Roman conquest, but not necessarily immediately with the military conquest. Uh, act, uh, actually, in, uh, in Gaul and, this all, and partly also in other areas such as Britain and Iberia, the majority of the opera were not uh, abandoned during or immediately after the Roman conquest. Actually, in some cases, we even see a flourishing of the opera in the decades after the Roman conquest. For example, in Bibracte, where we have aristocratic domus uh, copying Itali Italic models by, by, by local aristocracies or the foundation of a basilica. Uh, the east of the Rhine is a different uh, scenario. There we have other processes. And in some opera in Bavaria, for example, seem to have been abandoned before any Roman legions went there, so these were other processes. But in the, uh, in the areas of, of Gaul and uh, partly also in other areas of the West, the major break that we observe is not the Roman conquest by Julius Caesar, it's in the Augustan period where we see a large reorganization of the landscape of the social, political, and economic system. And, but some opera uh, continue to develop, so many uh, ended, but others continue to develop, and are some are even cities today. And this was a very quick overview. And uh, as I said, I'm sorry I will not be here for the discussion. If anybody has any specific questions or comments, I'm happy to get emails from you. And thank you very much.